Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and this episode is a little bit different. I'm going to start with your July to-do list, but I'm also going to incorporate questions, uh, more specifically vegetable questions, and even more specifically, tomato questions. I've been getting a lot of them posted on Facebook when I post pictures of my my garden, and it seems like people have a lot of tomato questions. And since there's not tons to do in the garden, I'm just going to combine them. So of course, because this does have questions, Joe is going to be answering me. And Joe, you haven't been here for a while. Whoa, excuse me? You haven't been here for a while. I haven't been here for a while. Um, In front of the quote, camera. You've been behind the scenes. Okay. Yes. So in other words, intrinsically involved with every single episode. Joe, people haven't heard your voice in a while. That's what they want. They don't get to sit across and see your annoying mannerisms like I do all the time. They're going to miss those. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) All right. So should I start with the July to-do list? What have you been doing? In my garden or in general? Whatever. Oh, 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 I'm supposed to talk about what I'm doing? A little bit. It's all about business. You got to get down to business. Um, I don't know. I've been gardening. (laughs) What are you talking about? Um, oh, cats. Yeah. Cats. Cats. Oh, more cats. Sorry. I'm, I think I'm blocking that out. Yeah. Um. At one time, not that long ago, as in days, mm -hmm. how many total cats were on our payroll? Um, yeah, uh, payroll without them contributing anything. Uh, at, on our property, there were 26. I only counted 23. So, oh, really? 26. I'll, I think I'll there's 26. It. Okay. Um, and then at the same time, I was feeding 10 cats on campus for a lady who's been, you know, feeding these, she's been feeding them for 10 years. They're all fixed. Um, and I took over. So now I'm, I offered to just do that two days a week. And then so we had three mama cats show up. And I know I saw one one day and I'm like, that's a female. I bet she's pregnant. And I got the trap out. But when you don't really know their habits and where they eat, it's almost impossible to trap them because you need to set the trap up where. And I, I only saw her two times. That was it. And I didn't see her. And then we saw an orange cat, which was coming out of my bubbly car, my antique bubbly car. Um, and I thought she had a gopher in her mouth. And I'm like, that's a new orange cat I haven't seen. And is that a gopher? But it turns out she had two orange kittens. And then just randomly, I was coming across. And then the one mama built this amazing cave in the the wood chip pile. Who's that? Oh, what's her name? Yeah. Red Sonia. Yeah. What is that from? Oh my God. Is that Conan the Barbarian? It was kind of a sequel follow up ish thing to Conan. Yeah. Red Sonia. Oh. And why is her name that? I don't know. Because she was ferocious. Oh. Is it PC? What do you mean? Politically correct? What? Why? Red Sonia? Yeah. Why not? I don't know. <laughs> she was a kick ass cat. <laughs> she, we were trying to. She was to a get... cat in the movie? No, this cat. <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, yes, yeah, oh yeah. yeah so we had to use cat. we had to use the kittens to try to trap her. Yeah, and she and was like she stalking. Was, us. She was stalking. She she grabbed the kitten twice because you guys were trying to be like nonchalant, like looking away. And when she went into the trap, oh, she was lightning. Oh fast. my gosh, she was she was getting so mad, so upset. Uh, so we finally trapped her, got her fixed, took the five cats, and we thought she had incorporated the orange cats too the other orange mommies, two orange cats, because the, she had some that looked very similar. And then, nope, a few days later, I'm wandering and, oh, look, at there's two orange kittens trying to get into that tree over there. 
And then so we trapped that mommy and got her fixed. And then literally like that weekend, you noticed another cat going under the back cottage with kittens. So I managed to trap two of those, get them fixed. And I haven't seen the mom and the other kitten in quite a while. So we were up to nine kittens. Um, Now they all have homes designated, but I'm not releasing any. They're not going to their homes until they're fixed. And five of them just got fixed yesterday. We tag teamed it. You took three to one place. I took two. Um, So now we're down to, I don't know how many we're down to. I have to do the math again. On the payroll? Yeah, on the payroll. Not sure. Yeah. I think we're going to be holding at about six. Once all the kittens go to their house, I think we're going to be holding at 16. Great. So that's six inside, and the rest are all fixed, strays, ferals, friendly ferals that have showed up. Yeah. 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 But they give us hours of enjoyment. Yeah. I mean, hours of work. I mean, that's, yeah. So when I say I've actually been gardening, I actually haven't been gardening as much and doing other stuff because the cats take a lot of time. And yeah, because the house is a cattery. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the cat saga. So I'm more of a cat lady these days than plant lady. Um, I'm going to be talking at the Tri-County Home and Garden Show up in uh, Roseville. August 20th, I'm going to be doing two talks, my Garden Myths talk and a Water Wise talk. Um, Last weekend, I went to the San Juan Water District and uh, gave a talk about my Mediterranean uh, gardening there, Water Wise gardening. So those were good turnouts. Um, I did a show based out of San Francisco. I went to San Francisco, their studio. It's a new uh, show, Live in the Bay, and of course, continuing with Good Day Sacramento and the daytime show out of Florida. So yeah, that's about it. So let me get going with July garden to do um, list. So like I said, there's not much to do. I mean, obviously harvest and watering and weed control are all the same. Um, But so what can you plant now? So really, I mean, it is most likely peak temperatures where you're at. Remember, this is coming from zone nine. Your zone might be completely different than this, but I'm sure wherever you're at, it's probably the hottest time of the year and you may or may not get water. I mean, rain, we don't for sure, but you could still plant okra. You could still plant pumpkins. You could start your first round or another round of corn, um, celery, and believe it or not, zone nine, you're going to want to start thinking about cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower. Those are your winter crops, but when people... Uh, it's very misleading because they're winter crops, but you start them in summer. So it's on the very, very early side. But if you want to start them by seed inside in a protected area, you can. I'm actually still harvesting cabbage. So um, it's very bizarre. I have cabbage right next to zucchini. Uh, what else? Shade peppers. If your peppers are burning, you're getting that sun scald, uh, put a little shade structure over them. Doesn't need to be much. Remember to mulch. The best way to smother weeds and preserve moisture is to mulch. I've used straw in one area. And of course, gold standard is compost because, you know, it mixes in and and adds nutrients and um, organisms, good organisms to your soil. You could prune your fruit trees this time of year. You could do a summer prune. So in the dormant season, you know, you're pruning, hard pruning to get shape. Um, But in the summer, if you're trying to keep your them shorter and you look at the top and there's just a lot of that new growth, not, not fruit up there, go ahead and cut them down. You could do that. Is it a must? No. Um, but if you're trying to maintain shorter plants, it'll, you'll allow you to drop them down now. And then in the fall, you'll just be able to thin out the centers, uh, paint your fruit trees too. If you haven't already, sun scald is a Number one reason why you see a lot of diseases affect them um, as far as wounds go. You, know, you They get sunburn. It's point of entry. Uh, you've heard me mention before, it's 50% diluted interior white latex paint. Thin your fruit. Um, you don't want branches breaking. I know it's hard to do, and a lot of trees will thin them themselves. But if they're touching, remove them so there's fruit not touching. If you have a limb leaning down, thin it. 
You could always prop that limb up, but it's still a good idea to thin your fruit. Deadhead flowers, especially annual flowers, you know, once they go to to seed, that sort of, you know, tells them, okay, end of the life cycle, you can prolong the season by deadheading. Um, Sometimes you just can't, like if you have a single headed giant sunflower and it's, you know, that's all it's going to set. You can't cut it off and, and it won't produce another big giant head. So um, but like zinnias and cosmos, do I? No, because I'm lazy. Um, snip off your flowers on your herbs if you're trying to harvest, especially this is a big one, basil, because there is a very distinct taste difference if you do let them go to flower and seed. Um, but of course, the pollinators and bees love them. So I have some basil that I'm just using as ornamentals and for the pollinators and the ones that you want to harvest just cut them back. You can cut basil back pretty far. You don't just need to remove the the uh, flowers. Go ahead and cut it back. And um, But really, that's it. Like I said, weed control, deep, deep watering. Um, start thinking about your winter vegetables. Hopefully, you're harvesting or getting ready to harvest. Hopefully, pests aren't too problematic. Remember, your best pest control is your hose preemptively if you've had white fly issues before. Um, you have aphid issues, just take the hose and blast them off. So far, it's looking pretty good in the garden as far as pests go, meaning not really there. So, um, I added the beneficial nematodes for cucumber beetles and I don't have any cucumber beetles. So, you know, it's hard to say I never had them before. And last year was a very strange weather year for us. Um, so maybe that was just one, you know, reason, but I like to, of course, beneficial nematodes are beneficial. That's why they're it. So hopefully they are doing their control. Um, so, all right, Joe, let's, let's get into some questions. This is, you know, I asked people, how is your garden growing successes? Um, you know, failures. And I don't think I use the term failures or, um, problems. Challenges. And cha- thank you. That was, I think the word I used maybe challenges and, uh, you know, then people posted their successes, but then of course I get a lot of, oh, why this, why this? And I'm like, there's a lot of duplicate questions. So instead of just answering them quickly by responding to them, like I normally do, um, I decided I might as well just incorporate them in here. So we'll just be very, um, tomato centric with a little bit of other vegetables thrown in. Okay. There's a lot of questions. Okay. All right. First one, not about tomatoes. Okay. My pepper plant has black at the base of its stem. What the hell is it? Did they say that? Did they write that? What the hell is it? They did. Okay. Well, you know, sometimes gardening makes you cuss. Sometimes I'm out there cursing. Well, definitely the gophers and weeds. I, I, yeah. All right. So you have a pepper plant and you're looking at the stems and it could be at the base anywhere, but you'll notice this discoloration and a lot of times it will look black, or a very dark purple. Sometimes it could be spots, but other times it could be solid. And if you notice, it's usually at sort of a junction of where the stems are branching off. That's completely normal. That's just slight different pigment, right? You know, your plant has chlorophyll, then anthocyanins and um, betalins and beta carotene and all that good stuff. Um, And so beta carotene, I should know this, carotenes. Um, And, uh, so really, I don't know why. I mean, a lot of times plants will mask chlorophyll if they don't need that area to, to uh, photosynthesize. Um, their stems can photosynthesize, but right at that junction, it just seems like that anthocyanin and the, the purple red pigments seem to show through more. So it can mimic, you know, and sort of freak people out like, wow, is this a, a fungus? But no, it's completely normal. So nothing she needs to do to rectify it. Just leave it. It's fine. No, it's, yeah, it's normal. It's part of the plant. Okay. All right. Next question. Tomato question. I have the same problem for the past few years. The plants grow great, big, green, but the flowers end up drying up and no tomatoes. Okay. This is probably the number one question. I got a lot of this. Um, So yeah, the plants grow great, but you're just not getting, and, and flowers, right? The flowers, it's flowering. Or is it not even flowering? The flowers end up drying. Okay. Yeah. So then it's flowering and you're just not getting fruit set. So past couple of years, I'm just going to say past couple of years have just sort of been your your um, your issues. It's been last p- couple of years have been very iffy. Last year was probably hands down the worst vegetable tomato year ever. Um, even talking to certain tomato growers, you know, 
just not good. Um, so this year, hopefully it is going to be different already, but a few things is, you know, a lot of people want the heirloom varieties for taste and color. Those are not bred to produce tons. Should you get some? Yes. The other ones that are bred to be a very large, they're not going to produce as much either. Should you get some? Yes. So I would say if you're just not getting a lot of fruit, go ahead and start with a good ace celebrity early girl. Um, and just see if that helps a bit, but also over fertilizing. If you're constantly giving your plant nitrogen, it's just sort of signaling it to grow and grow and put on new growth and it's not going to set fruit necessarily. Um, another problem is lack of pollination. Yes, they're wind pollinated. They need to be basically, uh, hit the pollen needs to be released at a certain quote frequency, but wind is enough to do that. But if it's in a protected area, you're not getting wind or you don't actually have pollinators around that are going to release the pollen. Um, that's a problem. So go ahead and shake it. Um, so those are generally the, the reasons why is the variety over fertilizing, not being pollinated. Um, and then just some strange off years that we have. Okay. Well, based on that, I'm going to go ahead and do another similar question okay. that you kind of answered in that one. What are your thoughts on using an electric toothbrush to mimic the vibrations made by a bee? For example, on tomato flower clusters for higher fruit set. Uh, have you ever heard the term buzz pollinator? Do tomato, do tomato hormone fruit sprays work? There's a lot of questions. You answer those ones first, then we'll continue on. Okay. Um, electric toothbrush. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about. The The buzz pollination is certain flowers um, need their male flowers or male parts of the flower, with the pollen, the anthers, to be buzzed at a certain frequency to release the pollen. Uh, basically, it's going to ensure that the flower is just not wasting pollen. Pollen is actually pretty valuable. Um, do you know that's why nectar plants evolved to um, start producing nectar? Uh, not off the top of my head, okay. I don't think. Yeah. I could have probably deduced I, that. I say that uh, pollen is like a gallon of milk because it's full of protein and vitamins and it costs a lot. And and nectar is literally like a liter of Coke. You could find it for like 99 cents. It's just sugar and water. So it's really cheap for the flower to make the nectar. And so you want to entice the pollinators to come and get, you reward them with nectar and they're gathering a little bit of pollen versus your pollen collectors who are just gathering the pollen. So this is another way to ensure that you're not going to waste pollen or pollen's not going to be knocked off by rain that the correct pollinator is going to it because you could have certain pollinators that are just going to drop on by and it may not then may not be the correct pollinator. Um, so really they have to be buzzed at a certain frequency. So, uh, but with tomatoes, wind is enough and shaking them is enough. Like we have begonias at work. They have to be buzzed. If you take a begonia flower and shake it, you're not, not going to uh, release any pollen. Um, so yeah, a toothbrush is a frequency enough. They have these little hand wand pollinators you could buy that are for tomatoes and fruit, but you could just use an electric toothbrush. Shaking it is probably going to do the trick. So, but if you want a little tool, if you're into tools, you can, um, yeah, don't worry. I'm, I won't take your electric toothbrush and go out there and do it. That's why I hide it from you. Mm -hmm. Notice you don't know where it's at. I don't know where it's at. There's a reason why. Yeah. Okay. Remember, remember I'm too spazzy. Um, to uh, use an electric toothbrush. Yeah, because I, I don't I, want you using mine for garden shit. Oh, for garden stuff. Yeah, yeah. I thought you meant, yeah. Mm -hmm, no, mm -hmm, yeah. no, you would use it outside. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Um, tomato hormone fruit set sprays. Yes, no. Work. Yeah, um, no, they're not, they're not going to work. No, because it's, it's, well, I'm trying to think if I've actually, if he means the calcium sprays. Um, but he says hormones. Says hormones. Says hormones. So no, um, hormones aren't going to work that way. Um, so you know the hormones that there's so many. 
I won't even know what would be in a hormone fruit set spray. Are, home, are hormones involved in fruit set at all? Yeah, of course. I mean, okay. um, they're involved in pretty much all aspects. So, you know, ethylene is, uh, you know, is what kills off fruit. So if you sprayed ethylene on it, that's used to speed up ripening, but it's not going to help with fruit set. Um, then you have, um, yeah, I mean, your auxin and cytokinin that's involved in uh, cell development, but none of those are going to work because they're not going to be able to just get to the fruit and do it. So no, no. Okay. Um, temperatures. Can high temperatures ruin tomato pollen grains? To a certain extent, yes. Um, as in, like, denature them? What's going on? Uh, just not make them as viable. Break them down. But AKA denature. Denature. Okay. 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 Break them down. Break them down, Joe. Uh, yeah. How I hot mean, does it have to get? It would have to get pretty hot. I mean, we're in a hot central. So the anything you read about fruit set. It's sort of out, thrown out the window because they say, oh, f fruit set will greatly decrease when temperatures get above 90. Well, we're in the Central Valley. Surprisingly, today, it was actually not even 90. This is an anomaly, but it's July 1st. But all around us are tomato fields. They're setting fruit. We do have fruit set. So if the rule was oh, above 90, you don't get fruit set. No one would be growing tomatoes in this region. But if you have constant 100 degree days, 103 degree days, yeah, that plant's going to be stressed. And it's not even so much the pollen that's not going to be viable. It's just everything else. But but most plants like squash, you know, the flowers open up in the morning and they close midday. So they're viable in the morning when it's cooler. And a lot of flowers only last a day. So that's a hit or miss question. What the temperature does it affect? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it sure. It sounded like Well, sure. It it sounded my interpretation of what this person was asking is uh -huh. if we have a hot day, yes. then and it's early in the year, could I potentially be screwed for fruit production because the pollen may get destroyed? Well, no, because the flowers only last a very short period of time. What he's saying, if there's one or two hot days, it's no. going to be gone. No, those fl those particular flowers that have opened up that day may not set fruit. Okay. All right. On this same point, can high or low temperatures cause blossom drop regardless of successful pollination? Okay, so he's saying after something's been pollinated, yes, then the blossoms drop. Correct. Sure. Sure, because it's a, a first thing plants usually drop when they're stressed is flowers and fruit. So if they've been pollinated, but you get a dry spell, the first thing they're going to drop is their, you know, what, it's basically you're not seeing the fruit, but it's already in yep. the process of building it. So yes. Get rid of the energetically expensive drain. There you go. Yep. Is that what you're calling our cats these days? <laughs> Well, wait a minute. Are you calling me that? <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> when times get hard. Sorry, yes. Watch out. Okay. Um, have you considered sending samples of affected plant parts to a plant pathologist to get a definite diagnosis? I know you have done this. I have not personally sent anything. What? Yeah, no. You were out of your mind. I've never sent plant samples. I have collected leaves for you before, like last winter. I had to put them, I had to go out, I had to get them in the refrigerator. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll take that back. Yes. Okay. That wasn't for me personally, though. That was for the researcher who was asking if I had certain things. So, I mean, I work right across from, like, where the plant pathology researches. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I've known a few graduate students mm -hmm. and whatever they're doing. Yes. So no, unless you have that ability to, you know, you can send some samples out sometimes to uh, labs. It's really expensive. And generally the ones that they're testing for, unless you have, you know, you're a farmer or you've rotated and you're still having issues, there's really... 
no point. Um, they could tell you most of the time someone could look at your plant and tell you, oh, it's going to be one of two pathogens, one of three pathogens. Um, then you may want to get your soil tested. I think getting your soil tested might be easier than sending a leaf sample to a plant path. Um, so yeah, no, I've never thought about it just because the need hasn't been there, but I've done it because I have the resources right by actually though. I think the two, two people I know they've graduated and moved on to, so I need to find new people in plant path. Yeah. All right. I guess the cost, it's sort of cost prohibitive. Oh, it would have to be. I'm sure it would be expensive to do. Yeah. But I, you know, people are having major problems in the, in you know, but generally it's well, just. All it's, right. So a viable thing that I see, mm -hmm. say somebody lives, say somebody has a lot of trees. Yes. And they're having all the, and these are very mature trees. Yes. And all of a sudden they're having random tree health issues that are going throughout the entire, you know, same set of species of trees. Mm -hmm. If they brought an arborist in, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be very possible that an arborist would take a sample and send out those samples to a pathologist? Who's a good arborist. Okay. And if he, if he wasn't able to say a hundred percent based on other things showing. Correct. Yes. Yes. Then yeah. if, he, yes. And yeah. And that's where, if you have large trees, I'm just that's thinking different. if someone's typically going to have a liaison between them and the plant pathologist. Yes, but people aren't going to have that with their vegetable garden. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And usually it's, you could start ruling things out and then you may have a handful of things left and then it's just, okay, next year I'm going to move it to this area. And then if you move it to the certain area and you don't have that problem again, you've just ruled out certain water molds and soil fungus that are in. And usually you could tell the difference, slight difference by examining the leaf. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Um, this person wants to know when you're going to be running for politics because that was quite the filibuster that you took on the avoidance of, I have never used a plant pathologist in the past before. Well, my um, campaign is going to be run on everyone um, needs to have at least two cats. <laughs> two. <laughs> Three, four. <laughs> And and dogs too. Everyone should. Um, yes, that's going to be my my platform. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And and um, and instead of votes, you could just get me donuts. <laughs> tomato blooms. Mm -hmm. Why does this person's tomato blooms dry up and fall off? The soil has not dried out yet. Okay, so we sort of already answered possibly the reasons why. Um, going back to the very first one, if your plant's healthy. You know, I mentioned that you're over, you know, fertilizing with nitrogen. Um, their soil's not dry, so it sounds like they're getting given enough water and it's not stressed for that. Remember, again, variety. So the plant will set flowers, but they have to be pollinated. Um, so it could be a pollination issue again. And then once again, it could be, you know, hot, dry wind dries plants out even more. Um, so always when we have a, a dry wind predicted always make sure that soil is definitely a little extra moist. Um, but those are the reasons going back to the, the first two it's it's sometimes it's, you know, the, the spike in temperatures, that pollen's gone. Those flowers are gone. They last short period of time. They didn't get a chance to get pollinated. Um, yeah. Okay. How do you know the difference between disease and just normal leaf death? Okay. Um, Normal leaf death will occur lower down. So older leaves, as they start shading, they've been there a while, they're going to turn yellow because nitrogen moves out, leaves turn yellow, they're going to brown as, you know, their cells die and water's not going to them. So it's lower down. If you have a disease, it's probably going to start randomly um, up top. And so sometimes it could be a little tricky because sometimes like back like early blight will occur low down as well. Sometimes fusarium will occur low down, but quickly you'll realize that it's moving towards the plant faster. So if you have a, an unusual amount of yellowing moving up your plant, you know you either are overwatering it and leaching out all the nitrogen, especially if it's in pot, um, or you have a disease that's starting to happen. So if you have lower, old, older leaves yellowing, that's totally fine. There's a minimal amount, but if it's rapidly increasing, then, you know. Okay. 
this is a pumpkin question, but it kind of relates back to the tomato pollination one you were talking about. Uh, this person wants to know if the shaking the leaf to pollinate, if that'll work on pumpkins as well. Um, no, it doesn't. Why? Because that pumpkins um, and long, all squash um, are they have male and female flowers separately. So if you shake a flower, shake a plant, the pollen's not going to be moved around. So what you have to look for, and I, I have a video of this on uh, YouTube, is you look for the female flowers and you look for the male flowers. They're on the same plant. They may not always be on the same plant at the same time. Early on, it tends to be more male flowers. And as the plant gets a little bit bigger, then the female flowers start. Um, so how you could tell female is if you look at the base of the flower, you'll see a swollen ovary, which is that your immature fruit. So then what you do for this case is in the morning, because the flowers will close up, um, is you just take a Q-tip or um, you've heard me mention you like your flux core brushes. Brushes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you just transfer the pollen over. So no, shaking will not work with pumpkins and squash because of the the anatomy of their flowers. Why are they geolocated disparately? The flowers? Yeah. Um, probably not to self-pollinate. Oh, so they should not self-pollinate? No, they, they can. Mm -hmm. It's just somewhat of a, you know, plants will either have um, perfect flowers where they can actually self-pollinate, like tomatoes. Then you'll have plants that are, you know, monoecious where you're with imperfect flowers where you have a male and female flower, but they're separate. So that sort of spaces out the chances of being pollinated or allows the genetic uh, transfer. And then you have, um, you know, then plants that only have male flowers or female flowers on a plant. So that really encourages or forces uh, cross pollination. But then sometimes even when you have perfect flowers, how they uh, prevent that is a time thing. Um, it's like sometimes the stamens will be out where the stigma is active and then the the stamens will curl up uh, or stick out and then the – so you have a time sometimes and sometimes even move. So there's multiple ways. But the idea is that you don't necessarily always want to be self-pollinating. Uh, All right. Back to a tomato question. My tomatoes are growing very tall, but they are quite spindly. Is there I, an issue with this? That could be usually when I think of spindly and tall is lack of sunlight. Um, they need at minimum, I mean, six hours is considered full sun for a plant, but that is minimum for a tomato. Um, so if you, if it's not in that intense sunlight, it will stretch and it may be trying to reach for the light. Um, also another, if it's in like a pot and the root system's not super developed, it may also be affected by that. So, you know, there's also different genetics of how some, you know, plants grow. I've seen some, I've had some tomatoes where that's sort of just genetically they're, they're a little bit more, um, I would say less full of leaves, but it, generally it's the first thing that comes to mind is lower light. Okay. Makes sense. So then does location matter? I would assume you would get that kind of growth pattern if you were in an area that was a bit more protected. Yeah. I mean, people have large trees and they're trying to, you know, they're like, okay, there's some sun right here or they're, you know, growing them up close to the house or they only have a patio with an overhang. Um, yeah. Okay. My tomatillo is not developing. It's only getting outside husks. You need two. This is a, so. You need two what? You need two plants. They do not self-pollinate they have to cross-pollinate. So they're not self-compatible is what you say. Um, and I don't think that's anywhere on any of the tags when you go buy them. And, you know, they're so similar to tomatoes as far as, you know, very closely related in the family um, that you think, oh, okay, it's fine. But no, so you'll, they won't get fully pollinated or pollinated at all. So the fruit won't swell. So that's the reason. So it's still time to plant, plant them. So just need another plant. You just need another plant. Doesn't even matter. There's there's uh, purple ones and um, I think yellow. And I think I think I've put both together and they've they've pollinated each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And any other plant that you'll get will have both male and female flowers on it. What? When you bring in a second plant to pollinate the first plant. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about getting your second plant no. being only female? No. No. Okay. No. All right. Okay. A couple of pest questions. Mm-hmm. First one, why does leaf curl on new, what does leaf curl on new leaves mean? Okay. Um, well, you prefaced it with a, a pest problem. I did. May not be a pest problem. Well, fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to say it's not a pest problem. Um, that's weather again. They, they curl due to stress, heat stress, heat response. I think it was all last year or the previous year. Uh, Might have been the previous year. It seemed like the tomato leaf were curled perpetually, but I still got a good fruit set. Um, so they curl. It's just a way of a, a plant protecting itself. You know, it's not trying to, you know, expose as much surface area to the sun. So the first thing it's going to do is curl in. Sometimes it could seem like it go through the whole entire uh, season with leaves curled up, even if the soil's moist. So sometimes they just curl at night. Sometimes they'll droop at night. Always check the soil. Remember, dig down about six inches. If the soil's slightly moist, just be prepared to water it maybe the next day or the following day. If it's bone dry, just know you need to water sooner than you have been and deep, deep soaking it. Um, but that's a stress response. It's not to say you need to automatically give it more water because it's more of a heat response than a moisture response, if that makes sense. Does it increase the loss of water? No, it's supposed to decrease the loss of water because- But it's, is it a response to an increased loss of water? No, it's it, it could be affected by loss of water, but it's more of an ambient air temperature and possibly humidity issue. We're really dry here, so it's it's more of an ambient air and humidity issue. Less humidity. Yes, less humidity. So increased evapotranspiration from the plant? Most likely, yes. Yeah. So maybe decreased water content from the plant? Sure, yes. I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of what would be mm -hmm. the physical response causing that curling to happen. And the I can see it being cellular decreasing due to water content going away. Yeah, I mean, it is temperature and water in plants go yeah. hand in hand. Okay. So along with, you know, humidity. And, mm -hmm. But um, for sure, it's probably, it's it's plants when it's hot, they photosynthesize, mm -hmm. they use water. A lot of times though, they can shut down. Um, and, and that's what it's trying to do is reduce its surface area. So it's shutting down. It's not as photosynthesizing as much or exposing its leaves to the the sun. So it's trying to protect from further water loss. Right, right. I don't know what point they would shut down completely photosynthesis. I don't know that. Hmm. Probably not at all. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. My garden is under attack from spider mites. Okay. Um, Which, by the way, what? we watched the other night mm -hmm. a fantastic show on our FDTV. We did. And it was, they talked about uh, spider mites in it. Yeah. And it was not a dumbed down show, I thought. No, it actually was, was, was more in depth than most. One of the most in depth, I mm -hmm. would say like con specific content shows that mm -hmm. I've seen. Um, should we say why we, ha we were sort of forced to watch that show. I don't think so. No. Well, we would have uh, watched it anyways. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, really good. Yeah. yeah. But our TV is haunted. <sighs> you think our TV is haunted? <laughs> well, by the uh, builder of this house. Um, you, <laughs> you've got quite because a. Because anytime I turn cooking on, TV turns off. Anytime I watch House Hunters HGTV, TV turns off. Anything that for some reason you don't like, the TV turns off. Lately, he's been muting it, muting it. And he'll randomly, randomly then put Apple TV on and scroll through. And usually he goes to like Oak Island um, or American Pickers, um, Bloomberg. Um, RFD TV. Yeah. And then he went and guess where he went? He randomly went when I had uh, uh, Tara... Uh, Coronado. Oh yeah, he went to her. Yeah, her like show on there. Yeah, 
And I've never gone there. I mean, I didn't even know it was there. And yeah, so. And and one other one. What? what? He likes Huel on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Huel Hauser on YouTube. So mm-hmm. everything we like, it goes. Or things that we don't even know we like goes. And people have seen this. Everything I like. Yeah. And then he'll just turn the TV off as soon as I turn cooking and, and HTV. Oh, you have fights. And Family Feud. He lets us watch Family Feud. Mm-hmm. We would never watch Family Feud, but he's allowing us to watch Family Feud. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I might have cursing fits with him. Yep. Yeah, anyways. Um, okay, so mites. First of all, make sure that um, – did they say spider? Sits? Spider mites. Okay, so tomatoes could get different mites. There's russet mites. They don't do cobwebbing. Um Two spot spider mites will do cobwebbing. Um, if he's just said garden, um, so we're not talking just tomatoes. So yeah, two spot spider mites, very distinct, very fine cobwebbing all over the plant. Uh, remember, when in doubt, you could always take a piece of paper underneath the plant, tap the plant, see what falls on it. Um, you know, a lot of these things you have to have like a loop or a hand lens to look at. But generally, if you have cobwebbing, you knock, you can actually see the spot, the two spot mites crawling around in the cobwebbing. Um, so for that, best thing to do, take a hose, blast it off, try to get as much cobwebbing and the eggs and the mites off as possible. And this time of year, it's iffy, but sulfur dust is my go to. Um, but do a test spot because um, remember, anything you p- apply on a plant this time of year, um, can burn even though sulfur doesn't, n- I've tried it in this heat and it didn't burn my plants. I used it in the conservatory. It doesn't burn the plants, but I always just do a test run and dusting sulfur is very difficult to, um, use because you have to have one of those little, um, like there used to be a trombone thing, an air blast, an air blaster you could get, uh, but you want to coat the plant, but even just a hose blast off repeatedly, hopefully, but yeah, if they're all over, uh, russet mites, um, that's a little bit different. You could, you could try, I would still blast off with a hose, um, and try sulfur dust for that as well. But yeah, that's, they're bad once they get a, a hold of things. Cause there's not too many beneficial insects that are going to swoop in once that netting, that cobwebbing is on there. All right. All right. Ag PhD. That oh, was the that name was of the, the show. show. Okay. Yeah. Really okay. good YouTube channel also. Mm, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, not, not really heavy on the organic side. <laughs> well, remember these are mi- I know, Midwest farmers. Midwest farmers. Yeah. 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 I don't think there's a whole lot of corn and wheat that's being grown full organic. No, anywhere. no. I'm just letting people know that it's, you know, who are, I mean, I find it interesting Very and good. yeah, cause they go into a little more in depth than, well, of course there are no gardening shows. So I was going to say like most gardening shows, there really are no gardening yeah, shows. I know. Yeah. So, well, hopefully we didn't confuse people on this one. Why would there be confusion? I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like I was very eloquent. No, I would say normal. <laughs> that was sort of a, <laughs> hmm, let me think about that answer. Uh, anyway, so if you have further questions, um, you could email me, Marlene the plant lady, gmail.com. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady. Uh, YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene. Uh, subscribe and follow there. And tell a friend. And um, yeah, rate and review. Apparently you could re- like review or rate on Spotify now. But apparently when you do a five star, that boosts you up in the search um, parameters. So more people will find your show. That's the whole. That's the whole thing. I listen to these podcasts who are very good at like plugging their shows like that. And as soon as I do it, it sounds like, I don't know. It's the worst app to use. What is Spotify? It's so hard. Oh yeah. But this on Apple, on Apple. No, you... I know. I'm just saying for, for podcasts, for yeah. spending all this money on podcasts, mm-hmm. especially if you want to use that thing, like in the car driving. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. It's a nightmare. Yeah. I'm not a, they're, they're, um, what is it? The user face interface, whatever it's called. The GUI. The GUI. The graphical user interface. Is that what it is? Yeah. So, but their search engine's better. Like Mm. I could search certain words and they come up more. So what I do is I search, I find it, and then I go see if it's on Apple Podcast because I can't find. Yeah, it's hard to read the episodes 
when I'm looking for podcasts. Apple has it all broken down. Hmm. And this is all true crime podcasts because that's all I all you listen survival to. and true crime. Yeah. Anyways, um, until next time, everyone. Happy gardening.